Something very like fright had come over all the explorers before anything more definite than rock and ooze and weed were seen. Each would have fled had he not feared the scorn of the others, and it was only half-heartedly that they searched, vainly as it proved, for some portable souvenir to bear away. It was Rodriguez, the Portuguese, who climbed up the foot of the monolith and shouted of what he had found. The rest followed him and looked curiously at the immense carved door with the now familiar squid dragon bas relief. It was, Johansson said, like a great barn door, and they all felt that it was a door because of the ornate lintel, threshold, and jams around it though they could not decide whether it lay flat like a trap door or slantwise like an outside cellar door. As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal, hence the relative position of everything else seemed phantasmally variable. Britain pushed at the stone in several places without result. Then Donovan felt over it, delicately around the edge, pressing each point separately as he went. He climbed interminably along the grotesque stone molding. That is, one could call it climbing if the thing was not, after all, horizontal. And the men wondered how any door in the universe could be so vast. Then, very softly and slowly, the arc great lintel began to give inward at the top, and they saw that it was balanced. Donovan slid or somehow propelled himself down or along the jam and rejoined his fellows, and everyone watched the queer recession of the monstrously carven door. In this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way, so that all the rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. The aperture was black, with a darkness almost material. That tenebrousness was indeed a positive quality, for it obscured such parts of the inner walls as ought to have been revealed, and actually burst forth like smoke from its eon-long imprisonment, visibly darkening the sun as it slunk away into the shrunken and gibbous sky on flapping membranous wings. The odor rising from the newly opened depths was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still, when it lumbered slobberingly into sight, and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poison city of madness. Poor Johansson's writing almost gave out when he wrote about this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks two perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy. Such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God, what wonder that across the earth a great architect went mad and poor Wilcox raved with fever in the telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awaked to claim his own. The stars were right again, 
and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design. A band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After vigintillions of years, Great Cthulhu was loose again, and ravening for delight. Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. God rest them, if there be any rest in the universe. They were Donovan, Gueria, and Angstrong. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over endless vistas of green crusted rock to the boat. And Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there. An angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Britain and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated, floundering at the edge of the water. Steam had not been suffered to go down entirely, despite the departure of all hands from the shore, and it was the work of only a few moments of feverish rushing up and down between wheel and engines to get the alert under way. Slowly, amidst the distorted horrors of that indescribable scene, she began to churn the lethal waters, whilst on the masonry of that charnel shore that was not of earth, the titan thing from the stars slavered and gibbered like polypheme, cursing the fleeing ship of Odysseus. Then, bolder than the storied Cyclops, great Cthulhu slid greasily into the water and began to pursue with vast wave-raising strokes of cosmic potency. Britain looked back and went mad, laughing shrilly as he kept on laughing at intervals till death found him one night in the cabin whilst Johansson was wandering deliriously. But Johansson had not given out yet, knowing that the thing could surely overtake the alert. Until steam was fully up, he resolved on a desperate chance and setting the engine for full speed, ran lightning-like on deck and reversed the wheel. There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine, and as the steam mounted higher and higher, the brave Norwegian drove his vessel head-on against the pursuing jelly, which rose above the unclean froth like a stern of a demon galleon. The awful squid head, with writhing feelers, came nearly up to the bowsprit of the sturdy yacht. But Johansson drove on restlessly. There was a bursting, as of an exploding bladder, a slushy nastiness, as of a cloven sunfish, a stench, as of a thousand opened graves, and a sound that the chronicler could not put on paper. For an instant the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and then there was only a venomous seething astern, where, God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of the nameless sky spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form, whilst its distance widened every second as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. That was all. After that, Johansson only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the laughing maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after that first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. Then came the storm of April 2nd, and a gathering of the clouds about his consciousness. 
there is a sense of spectral whirling through liquid gulfs of infinity, of dizzying rides through reeling universes on a comet's tail, and of hysterical plunges from the pit of the moon, and from the moon back again to the pit, all livened by a cacinating chorus of the distorted, hilarious elder gods and the green, bat-winged, mocking imps of Tartarus. Out of that dream came rescue, the vigilant, the vice-admiralty, court, the streets of Dunedin, and the long voyage back home to the old house by the Egerberg. He could not tell. They would think him mad. He would write of what he knew before death came, but his wife must not guess. Death would be a boon if only it could blot out the memories. That was the document I read, and now I have placed it in the tin box beside the bass relief, and the papers of Professor Angle with it should go this record of mine, this test of my own insanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror, and even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansson went, so I shall go. I know too much, and the cult still lives. Cthulhu still lives, too, I suppose again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. His accursed city is sunken once more. For the vigilant sailed over the spot after the April storm, but his ministers on earth, still below, prance and slay around idle caped monoliths in lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or else the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen may sink, and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness waits and dreams in the deep and decay, spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that, if I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other eye.